So welcome to the Indiana Medical History Museum. This biannual lecture series was developed in 2006 in partnership with what is now the University of Indianapolis Human Identification Center to share stories from the many areas that are related to uh, forensic science, both past and present. I'm very pleased to introduce you to this evening's speaker, Norma Erickson. Norma is a historian uh, with us here at the Indiana Medical History Museum. She has a Master of Arts in History from IEPY, and she um, has a previous career, however, in science as well. And from 1987 until 1989, she was an analyst doing drug testing at the IU Sports Ma Medicine Lab here in Indianapolis. This is here this evening to tell us uh, the story of the doping control laboratory of the 10th Pan American Games, which were held here in Indianapolis in 1987. I only vaguely remember that. Uh, <laughs> Norma is a graduate of IUPUI with a bachelor's degree in religious studies and general studies with a concentration in math and science, and again, a master of arts in US history. Her thesis focused on African American healthcare in Indianapolis at the turn of the 20th century. Um, I just gave you a, a hint about her work as a laboratory analyst, but she also worked in clinical, forensic, and criminal justice testing laboratories as well. More recently, she was the managing editor of IJHAC, a journal of humanities and arts computing, and she was the assistant managing editor of the digital version of the Encyclopedia of Indianapolis, which just came out uh, last year through the Polis Center and through um, the Central Library. As a volunteer here at the Indiana Medical History Museum, she began giving tours of the old pathology building in 2004 and has been deeply involved here in various capacities ever since. <coughs> Excuse me. And she's the author of Ted Hartley, A Half Century Behind the Wheel in uh, Racing Cars Magazine, and Extending Helpfulness, Carl D. Fisher's Philanthropy to African Americans in Traces of Indiana and Midwestern History. Uh, there, there are others that she did not, um, did not include in her bio. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Norma Erickson. Uh, thank you for coming. This, this is really exciting. Uh, we're doing this hybrid thing, the technology uh, Sarah set up is wonderful. And uh, actually, it's probably better to check it out on me. So, so if something doesn't work, I'll be very forgiving. So I'm going to take this off. So uh, this paper is somewhat a scroll down memory lane. I was involved in the testing, uh, the drug testing during the Pan American Games. But as a historian, I would like to place that uh, testing within the larger history of doping control, and then also in the history of Indianapolis, of which the games was a very important part. So uh, those are my goals today. Uh, and certainly as a proud citizen of Indianapolis, I will probably emphasize some really, really good points about that. So how did only the second International Olympic Committee accredited laboratory in the U.S. land in Indianapolis, a landlocked city which in 1987 maybe had a handful of buildings over 15 stories tall. Um, didn't really have uh, a lot going on. People was calling people were calling it India no place and and things like that. How did that happen? And this is why I added another term to the title, Sidious. Altius Fortius, of course, is the Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger. And I added volume, which may not be the right word, but it was the best Latin I could find that would communicate the term willingness, uh, voluntarily wanting to do something. And that was really, I believe, how this all happened. Uh, urban plant, urban planning played a huge role in this. In the late 60s, the suburbs spread. Shopping strip malls, malls were built. Uh, further out, white flight entered, and a lot of people left the city. And by the time the 1970s started, the downtown was pretty much a ghost town. Uh, after 5 o'clock, there wasn't much moving in it. But at the, as the 1970s dawned, the city consolidated services, 
uh, within the entire county, except for the excluded cities of Beach Grove, Lawrence, Southport, and the town of Speedway, uh, and just made it all one big thing. And the mayor, of course, was Richard Luger, and he had a vision for downtown. Uh, and he championed that uh, investing in a future that would bring people back downtown, more community pride, and would in effect brand the city. And the new brand would be the amateur sports capital. And this wasn't a stretch, really. Uh, Indianapolis already had a sport focus for a long time. From the 1890s, it was a hotbed of bicycle racing activity, drawing athletes from around the country to its tracks. And in the early 20th century, it became the home of the Indianapolis 500 and a mecca for automobile racing, luring competitors from all over the world. It also became a city that was known for moving large groups of people in and out of places because of the race. The year 1977 saw the first half marathon associated with the month of May, the mini, uh, was folded into the 500 festival in 1979. And the 500 Festival is a month-long conglomeration of events uh, that began in 1957. Uh, and today, the Mini is the largest competed half marathon in the United States and the seventh largest running uh, event in the United States. In that same year, 1979, the Indiana Sports Corporation was formed for the purpose of recruiting sporting events to Indiana to spearhead the building of sporting activities. And uh, the city turned its bicycling routes to New England's first venue that completed was the major Taylor Bell down. In Indiana's long history as a basketball state was already another easily accepted public plan for Market Square Arena, which would host professional basketball games. Um, building on this momentum, the in Indiana Sports Corporation, ISC, uh, placed a bid for the National Sports Festival. Nineteen eighty-two. It was an Olympic-style event that used multiple venues, was highly successful, and leaned heavily on volunteers to carry out all the accomplish all the the operations of that. And it was beginning to cement its goal as the amateur sports capital of the United States. It set its sight on a higher goal: the 1991 Pan American Games. Uh, and in researching things on this, this. Last week, I read that Omaha, Nebraska thinks it's going to be the amateur sports capital for the world. They did a curling championship. So they're going to be there. State wrote a different schedule uh, besides the 1991 Pan Am Games. The host in 1987 was supposed to be Chile. It dropped out in 1984. Ecuador picked up the banner. They dropped it right away. And the IOC was left with not very long to go and no place to have the game. And since uh, the National Sports Festival, there were already venues in place, uh, the IOC actually approached Indianapolis and said, instead of waiting until 1991, could you go ahead and have it in 1987? So the city was awarded for its willingness by a 30 month planning process that typically took five years to have it done. Uh, this paper is not really intended to be a comprehensive history of doping in sport uh, or the technology of detection, but a few key events help put it in perspective. Uh, performance enhancing drugs are noted back as far as the Greeks in battle. Uh, they would take substances that would make them stronger or not uh, feel pain and things like that. So uh, it's not surprising uh, there is a human connection between war and um, human performance. Uh, the first modern Olympic marathon winner is alleged to have made it through the race with brandy and strychnine. Strychnine. Large quantities kills you, small quantities is a stimulant. And it was used uh, not only back then, but also cyclists used it. The death of a French cyclist using a stimulant during the 1960 Rome Olympics brought attention to the problem. Uh, first people had to call it a problem. What's the problem? If we are being able to do this and make people better, why don't we just have competition for making people better? Uh, but there was also that feeling that sport was supposed to be this pure human activity, uh, that we relied just on the athlete and 
what that athlete had done personally to make themselves faster, higher, stronger. So what ran out, what ran, what won out was the fact that uh, pure sport won over synthetic athleticism. Uh, the first Olympic doping test is said to be in Mexico City, uh, but it actually occurred in Grenoble, France in the Winter Games right before that. Uh, and they also in, introduced gender testing that year. That would be 1968. More attention came to the problem in the 1970s when the East German women's swimming team showed up looking like they could play lane, linebacker for an NFL team. What's going on there? Raised some eyebrows. And throughout the 70s, uh, controversy in both sport and politics came for meaningful development. Uh, and as it says here, it was in 1967 then, uh, after death, that IOC said, we're going to start a commission. Uh, so there were politics that were going on. Uh, first was Moscow, Moscow Olympics in 1980. Um, the United States and several other uh, countries boycotted the Moscow Summer Olympics because the Soviet Union had invaded the country, Afghanistan. And in 1984, the USSR and 14 Eastern Bloc and allied countries boycotted the Los Angeles Olympics. So while the, while the United States reason for boycott of Moscow was clearly political, the revenge boycott of the USSR on the surface felt political until at least 2016 when we found out that it was not political at all. They were dodging because there were uh, advances in technology to uh, catch uh, doping that wasn't in place before and uh, that they thought would happen in LA. Because the year before that, in 1983, the Pan Am Games were in Caracas, Venezuela. And uh, so everybody comes, some people have used steroids, never been a problem. Uh, but enrolled a man called Manfred Donicky with a semi full of equipment and started setting up a drug testing lab and started catching people for having steroids on board. Uh, very, very quickly, there were a lot of people that for some reason just had to go home. They just, or I'm hurt, I can't compete. And a lot of them was the U.S. weightlifting team. They decided to just back out completely after they started seeing that there were positive tests. So uh, what Donicky did that was a little different, uh, one of the steroids that was used was testosterone. Testosterone, of course, is a normal hormone. So what do you do when someone's taking something that's normally in a male body anyway? Uh, well, he uh, developed a test to not just test for testosterone, but also for an isomer of that that the body produces. Uh, every time it does that, it has a three to one ratio of this other compound called epitestosterone. So he tested both, did the rate math, and if it was a greater than three to one ratio, that meant the person had taken misogynous testosterone. And that's what he was catching people with. Of his testing, there were, this is what I'm trying to figure out here, sorry, um, 30 positive tests, 16 in male winners, and the weightlifting team went home. Um, and that paper was backed up by, of course, in 2016, when it was revealed that the Soviets and Russia had had a state-operated uh, anti-anti-doping <laughs> control program uh, in place for a long time, and then it subsequently got banned from the Olympics. But back in Caracas, technology had finally caught up. With the athletes, that was something that was very important, uh, was the technology that was developed. Uh, when it came to 1987, for instance, in the Pan Am Games, the instrumentation I worked on had only been developed and marketed two years before the Pan Am Games, or we wouldn't have been able to use that. I've already outlined why the city wanted and needed to host the Pan Am Games. Another factor were the needs of PASO, which was the Pan American Sports Organization, and the IOC. Uh, one thing they needed was a lab that could provide 24-hour turnaround time, 36 hours for steroids at the peak of the event. So it had to be a lab 
here. You could not get, you couldn't send it away. You probably could. And in fact, in doing research in this in the archives of IUPUI, in the, I think it's in the Chancellor's archives, uh, the IOC was actually in talks with Don Catlin, who was the head of the LA Olympic Lab in 1984, for him to somehow run the lab and do that. But uh, it did not end up that way. Uh, his lab, uh, the temporary makeshift lab, just wasn't going to work. And so IU made a bid. They asked, and they got response, and a lab was set up. And there were many, there were a couple different departments who could have done this at the university. Uh, the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology could have done it. Uh, the Department of Biochemistry could have done it. But the lab that was chosen was the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. It made total sense because they had a pool of workers who were already trained in technique, laboratory technique, and um, were used to high throughput, high volume testing, and uh, you know, areas of work that were around the clock, which is what was going to happen. So the pathology department was absolutely the best one. And Dr. Carlton Norskow was the director and was highly supportive of all its needs. And I've not been changing this. What does that mean? That's Moscow. Sorry. I got behind. That's Karaka. Uh, there's Dr. Donaghy. Okay, so he came. He was here during the Pan Am Games. Uh, and the committee had to rent a, a bicycle for him <laughs> uh, so he could ride, but he was here. He was a cyclist. Uh, he had uh, participated in the Tour de France in 1960 and 1961. And I told you there was already some uh, talk with Donaghy's lab, or not Donaghy's, but uh, Catlin's lab during the TCLA at the ceremony, but it went to IU. And this, uh, the team that was headed up by Dr. John Benzinger, who was a very gifted clinical pathologist and management person and he's the one that really pulled it all together, got the lab going, got people trained, and got the IOC certification by January of the year that the Pan Am Games was going to be held. It really was a great effort. It was also seeded by a $2 million grant from the Lilly Foundation uh, that we had tremendous support from Hewlett Packard. That was who made the mass specs that we used at that time. They have now spun that off to Agilent is the name of the company, but uh, HP had an engineer on site. There would be no downtime. Everything would keep running. Uh, they, they made sure of that. Um, the other thing we had was, okay, we worked around the clock. Um, you didn't have to work 16 hours, but a lot of people did uh, to get that done. And uh, we were fed three hot meals a day by <laughs> Dr. North Scout's administrative assistant, Susan Hill, who uh, trucked in food all the time. There were snacks all the time. It was great. Uh, I think I was the only one with a child at that time, and my mom moved in with me and gave everything for three weeks, because all I did was come home and sleep for eight hours and go back to the lab. So the outcome, let the games begin. This is, of course, the front stretch of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is where the opening ceremonies were held. Uh, all the way down the, the front stretch. And um, for those of you who weren't around at that time, there would be these little shows happening every so often. So everybody, if you were in your area, you got to see the, the show. Um, and after that happened, then we started doing the testing. Now, this is also from the IEPR archives. It's some of the paper work that's there that uh, laid out the and what was needed by the committee. So this is for the actual drug collection, the urine collection station, um, a, tent, a table, 15 chairs, a color television, a refrigerator, uh, waste can, small sofa. So that was what was needed. And then um, this is a schedule. There was a big brouhaha the first day they didn't test the right teams or something. I don't know what that was about. Uh, but this is who they were testing, and um, for Sunday, August 23rd. And here's the procedure. 
I'm going to skip over here. I want to keep looking around. Uh, the athlete leaves the field of play with an official escort. It may be different now, but I doubt that it's much different uh, because you don't want anything to happen to that athlete to, to drink anything or something like that in between uh, the testing site. The athlete selects the materials that the sample is going to go into, picking themselves. They got a whole drawer full or a box full of cups. They're the one that we can get. They're not given something. Um, they have two specimen bottles and two uh, containers that would they would be put in envelopes to be transported to the lab. So one was called the A sample and the other is the B sample, but it's just from the same sample that's poured into these two cups. Uh, the athlete watches while the cup is sealed. Paper signed, you know, there's no tampering after that. They're tamper proof seals that go off to the lab. Uh, the B sample is stored, and then the A stamp sample gets tested. Then in the lab, if there was a positive found, uh, the A sample would normally get tested again. And then if it was contested, then the athlete and anybody they wanted, their attorney, your mother, anybody could come and sit and watch as the confirmation test was made. And that, uh, that did happen. Um, oh, and here's the uh, techniques that we use. I'm going to step over here again. Uh, screening with gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, thin layer chromatography, and then confirmations are generally with mass spectrometry. The first test, the first the screen gathered this information, but you always confirmed with a whole different method. That's another way of being absolutely sure that we are really calling it what it is. Uh, the gas, chroma, uh, gas chromatography, uh, mass spectrometry, GPMS, LC, liquid chromatography, chromatography, MS, and then derivatization. So chromatography is just the separation, separation. You got hundreds, if not thousands of compounds in that urine and you want to get rid of everything else and you just want to be looking for what you're looking for. So there are different extraction methods that you go through uh, to do that. And then when you uh, put it into uh, a chromatograph, it's going to allow the sample to pass through an area and either how long it takes to pass through the area and then when it gets to the end what the molecule looks like it gets exploded and in a way that for every molecule it explodes exactly the same way they become like a fingerprint when you detect it at the other end so that's just really a simple explanation of what it is and if you have a compound that's really little uh it's just going to go right through really fast no you slow it down by artificially uh, latching a heavier molecule onto it that drags it down, but still it's going to separate and, and go on through. And then you're able to identify it not only by what it looks like, but how long it took to get there. Sorry. I think there's one more here. Ultimately, there were 900. Uh, so far as the medalists, there were six positive athletes. Uh, the U.S. silver hammer throw was positive for uh, testosterone, epitestosterone or so. Uh, a Brazilian shooter took beta blockers. Heart medicine, why? Calms them down. You're not as shaky. Uh, and I understand some of the stuff I'm telling you because someone said, well, this is what happened. <laughs> it would slow their heartbeat down and they shoot between the heartbeats. Um, equestrians will use it so they're not skittery and their horse doesn't recognize their nervousness. Um, basketball, a decongestant. There are like ephedrine or something in the decongestant that would be a band subject uh, substance uh, and in weightlifting there were three positives 
uh, two steroids in one diuretic. Uh, the, the, and the diuretic was the area that I was working in. Um, what uh, the plan was for the, the testing also and how we were able to get that going very quickly was, uh, as I mentioned, we had um, laboratory people that ran the teams and then they had uh, some interns come from another college and they did the extraction part. So uh, the diuretic uh, one was mine. I did the diuretic part. And for the confirmation, it was one of the longest confirmations we have. It was eight hours long to do that test. And that athlete sat with me the entire time. An 18-year-old from Nicaragua, he spoke no English. I spoke no Spanish. We sat there all day together. Um, there were other ones, there were other drugs found also, but they didn't have, uh, they weren't involved with metalists, so they get as, didn't get as much press as that. Uh, but one of the biggest things was that a buzz that no one heard outside. Uh, they were getting so good at finding the drugs, it was getting harder and harder for the athletes to uh, avoid detection. It had been masking uh, detection. Something. Uh, the diuretic uh, is a masking agent. Uh, an athlete will drink so much water that it waters their urine down and decreases the concentration of the drug that can be found. Uh, it also, if you're a weightlifter and you want to be in a different weight class, uh, take a diuretic, get rid of a lot of water, weigh light, rehydrate. So uh, that was another thing. But one of the masking agents that had not yet been banned uh, by the IOC was kind of thought uh, that, that had happened in LA uh, was probenicid. And probenicid is a drug that was actually used in the 50s, um, maybe even later too, uh, to stop the block, blocking of excreting penicillin. Penicillin, when you take it, it doesn't get metabolized. Most drugs get broken down into something else. The penicillin didn't. It would go straight through your body and into your urine. And in order to keep penicillin in you longer to do its job, this drug was supposed to allow that to happen. Well, it also worked for keeping steroids in too. So uh, there were athletes that were taking a probenicid they expected, and they needed to know if it was going to happen again and so it wasn't banned, but it was looked for. And there were at least three athletes that had probenicid that were not sanctioned anyway because it wasn't a banned substance. But they did, they were able to get it banned. I don't think they got it banned by Calgary. Calgary was the Winter Olympics that was going to come in 88. Um, maybe they did get it banned, but uh, that was that was it. And it was a, you know, it was U.S. track and field. People have it. So there's a really long list of banned substances. It grows all the time. Uh, I, I don't know what any of those are now. Uh, but one thing that I thought was very interesting at the time, uh, it's not that way now, but cocaine and marijuana were not banned substances in 1987. The belief was that an elite athlete would never put that in their body. Uh, oh. So as the games went on and the testing was done, um, oh, there they are, right there. Sorry. Those are the diuretics that I forgot to slide it to. I'm sorry. Uh, the one that we found was hydrochlorothiazide, which was absolutely the easiest one to find. Totally, you could see it from across the room on the chromatograph. It had such a, a characteristic uh, pattern. Um, ooh, we're getting to the conclusion. I do want to bring up uh, again um, a little bit of the stats of that. Uh, 38 nations were involved. And as I tried to bring into this, how this happened here, uh, there were, this is the figure given to me, uh, 37,000 volunteers that 
from Indianapolis or the state, because you know, things took place around the state too. They were rowing out, something was up in Michigan City and kayaking. kayaking yeah. So it was not just right here in Indianapolis. So 37,000 volunteers to get it done. 10 federal, uh, 10 federal agencies coordinated. Jerry just mentioned today how they took all the trash cans out of downtown because they didn't want someone to place a bomb in them. Uh, they had to think of those things. And Vice President Bush came. In a press conference held at the games, the Paso president, Dr. Eduardo de Rose, uh, praised the laboratory for the job they were doing. Um, and the, the job they were doing, as I mentioned, the laboratory people were um, already well trained, uh, utilized medical technologists, uh, a, a profession that's now called medical laboratory scientists. Uh, they were able to ramp up in a short time. They also used interns from Luther College in Iowa, which I think was Dr. Nordstrahl's alma mater. They had a bunch of uh, chemistry students came. So we taught them just to do one part, and they did it fast, and that was uh, really good. But the point is, at any other laboratory than this, um, the people doing the test would have been uh, straight biochemists, uh, strict graduate students in a chemistry program or something like that. Uh, the fact that they use medical technologists opened it up to one group of people who generally you don't see at all ever uh, are women. Uh, medical te technologists uh, at that time and even now are more predominantly women. When you have your lab test done it, it goes away and you don't see what happens. It's probably a woman who's doing the job uh, in a basement somewhere or something like that. So this was an opportunity for us uh, as medical technologists to do a job uh, that would have been close to us at probably at any other venue, uh, except that, uh, of course, Dr. Nordskow and Dr. Benfinger uh, bringing us in to do that job, of which I was really, uh, I'm getting the pump. <laughs> because we were competing too. We really, mm, so uh, it was really quite a, a, a great experience. So, Let's read what I wrote. My thing is over there. I can't see it. Um, nesting agents, that was important. Uh, the lab followed unprecedented laboratory women. Uh, and oh, it did keep on for several years. Uh, the lab did NCAA testing and testing for the National Football League um, for a long time. And then finally, it was closed. That's me with my 80s hair. And big glasses. I have other pictures too of the workers, but I didn't ask their permission. So I felt like I really shouldn't put their pictures up there without knowing them. So uh, that's, that's Barb, she's got her head turned. So we don't, you don't know who that is, do you? So that's, that's us, that's the job. Okay, I'm done. Well, thank you all for being here and thank you, Norma, thank you. for a really interesting talk as usual. Uh, again, uh, we have our Landy family lecture coming up on May 18th. We hope to see you there. Uh, that will be in person again, but we'll also be streaming it and hopefully work out some of the kinks that we might have had with, with the streaming today. So those of you who are joining us online, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear that. Uh, and uh, that's, that's it. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.